1330 W.E.B.Y. Northwest Florida's Talk Radio. This is your turn. A live call-in show featuring spirited discussion and debate about issues that matter to the community. Stay with us to hear what Northwest Florida thinks. Better yet, call in at 623-1330 and tell us what you think. It's your turn here on 1330 W.E.B.Y. Northwest Florida's Talk Radio. Now, here's the host of Your Turn. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Giacchino. I'm Corporate Counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom, and I'm hosting this version of Your Turn, the program that I've dubbed Meeting Nonsense with Common Sense. To learn more about my organization, you can find us on the web at www.cfif.org. Although I'd like you to go there now, I really want you to go to a different website. I'd like you to pull up www.firstladiesman.com. Firstladiesman.com. Yes, it's time to welcome back one of my favorite guests, Andrew Oak. Andrew Oak is, in fact, the First Lady's Man. He is also an award-winning television producer who's traveled the world in search of provocative stories and adventures. In 2012, he began a historical journey as he traversed America for over a year, documenting the lives of every First Lady of the United States for a C-SPAN series titled First Ladies, Influence, and Image. That series aired in 2013. It also was the springboard for two books, two of my favorite books. I know they're also uh, some of the favorite books of my daughter. So, I mean, this crosses generations, folks. And I'm sure she'll be passing them down to her daughters as well. Uh, Should she have some someday, I hope. Anyway, they are titled Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. There is now a volume one and a volume two. And in honor of Women's History Month, we have a couple days left, we are bringing Andrew back to talk about some of the most amazing women in history. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining me again. Renee, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to do your show. Well, it's great to have you back. And I'd like to begin where it all began when we talk about women's history and we talk about women who were very influential in not just their husband's administrations, but in shaping America. You know, we absolutely, I believe, have to start as America did and as your first book does with Martha Washington. Give us your thoughts. Well, I think you're right, you know, and and my research has shown that in letters George Washington wrote back in the day, he said during the Revolutionary War that he couldn't think straight without his wife at his side. And so what this translates into modern times is these women have been advisors and counsel to these presidents or future presidents in the case of Martha Washington during the Revolutionary War, but she traveled at great personal risk to be with General Washington at nearly every 13 of the winter encampments during the Revolutionary War, and, you know, she wasn't there just to cook his breakfast, you know. They, they were, she, she was counsel. She was advice. She was a confidant. She could give him, uh, you know, a, a, an outside look at things, a fresh perspective. And this travels all the way through our country as these women have been and continue to be an integral partner in our formation, continuation, and success of America. They've been a part of it right from the very beginning. Let me um, ask you a little bit of, of a question, a side note. Have you watched Game of Thrones? I, a, a little Here and there. I'm, okay. I'm not a huge fan. I know people are, and I, and I know that the premise of the show. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, for folks who, you know, want to believe that maybe there, there might be some historical relation, you know, somewhere back in time to some of this, I think it would come as a little bit of a surprise to see with those characters, as with some of our presidents, particularly the presidents, our early presidents, how much they houses their mothers, the women in their lives, to be their confidants, to also, you know, sort of bring some semblance of of calm into their lives and into, you know, some very chaotic times. One hundred percent. And, and, you know, I, I, I'm sure readers, uh, readers, well, readers of my book and, and listeners of the radio show w- will remember that when Ronald Reagan was president, he made a statement, something along the lines of saying, I don't make any decision without running it by Nancy. And people got very upset by that. But if people knew the historical relevance and understood these women for what they are, they are the most powerful and influential, unpaid and unelected women in the world just by nature of who they're married to. And Nancy Reagan said that. She said, I sleep in the same bed with a man nearly every night. 
you know, when, when, when I go home and talk to my significant other and when people go home, they say, you know, well, how was your day today? I'll say, well, I was on with Renee again. It was a great show. When President Obama or President Bush or President Trump, when they go home, their wife says, you know, how was your day? They say, well, Iraq's a problem or Putin's a problem. Well, tell me about it. And this has been going on, like I say, from the beginning of the Revolutionary War. We would not be a country. We would not be America without the influence and, and, and input of these women. Do you mind if I um, throw you some, I don't think they're going to be curveballs, but do you mind if I, if I um, pepper our interview with some quiz questions on our first ladies? Yeah, any, anything you got. Okay. Well, we know that, that the U.S. Postal Service wants to remember the ladies, and this is not a hint, by the way. Um, they want to remember the ladies. And, in fact, you know, anyone who gets a picture on a postage stamp, I mean, certainly you don't want your picture hanging up on the wall in the post office, but maybe on a postage stamp, <laughs> right? The difference between the post office and the postal stamp. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I'll make that, let's make that very clear. Uh, which first lady was the first to have her uh, face appear on a U.S. postage stamp? Oh, my goodness. I... I... I know that I'll throw out some postal fact. Uh, you, 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 you reference remember the ladies, and I know that that comes from an Abigail Adams. But that was not a hint. I made that very clear. But that was not a hint. No, not I'm a not going to take that. that I'm not Don't take, take that, that bait. I know that. I know that Anna Harrison was the first first lady not to have to pay for postage, and that was part of the fact that her husband died in office. There's a term for it that, that escapes me uh, right now. Um, I'm, I'm actually sitting in, in, in a Memphis airport, and all I can think of is when Elvis made the postage stamp and how happy I was <laughs> when he did because I'm a huge fan, but I, I don't know. I do not know who the first first lady to be on a postage stamp was. The first wife of a president to appear on U.S. postage stamp was Martha Washington, appropriately so. You know, it, 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 would, it would have been my guess, and it does seem to make sense, but, and I know that they're talking about, you know, it's funny, they're talking about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt being on the, the $20 bill as opposed to Jackson, and, uh, and, and, and that leads us into, into volume two, and, and another, if I can jump ahead a, Please do. a little bit and just throw out this fact. Most people where I go and speak, and I think most Americans and people the world over, when you hear the name Roosevelt, you think of Eleanor. And, right. and I get that. She's the longest sitting and highly influential, always polls at number one. But it's Edith Roosevelt that expanded the White House and brought back the Federalist style that we know and love today and that the Adamses would recognize should they walk into a modern White House because they took it from the Victorian area era, uh, Edith Roosevelt did, and she hired New York architects, but what she was after was she wanted to create a house within the people's house where a large family like hers with six kids could live and exist while the the business at hand of, of the first you know, uh, reason why we have a White House. It is the office of the president. Edith Roosevelt is the one that created the East and West Wings to create this business. So a, a woman that we wouldn't even name when naming First Ladies or Roosevelt is the reason why we look at the structure that we look at today. That's how influential these women have been. Now, Jackie had her fair share of criticism thrown at her for changes she made in the White House. I think Melania as well. Um, you know, back these women up. I mean, they, they have to live there. They're, some of them are raising their families there. And, and I mean, I think you raise a, an extremely valid point, and, and that is that, you know, some may think they are doing it, you know, to make their lives more comfortable or to, you know, glorify themselves, but I think you make an extremely valid point that they viewed it as really America's home. Well, yeah, and, and, and last time I checked, mother was a very hard job and a very important job. Imagine raising a child in the public eye with the public criticisms, and, and Jacqueline Kennedy would not have escaped any of those and didn't escape any of those as, as she was part of the modern world, the televised world. Michelle uh, Obama and Melania Trump have the distinct privilege or, or displeasure of being the first social media first ladies. And the, mm -hmm. the, the unchecked, unbridled, and, and some often unsupported uh, criticisms they receive over social media is just brutal. Um, I, I think Melania Trump does a wonderful job in, in leading by example with anti-bullying. She doesn't respond to those criticisms. She just holds her head high, puts on a great outfit, goes out and does the good work that she does, and and that's good work that Jacqueline Kennedy did too. I mean, you know, she created 
the, the White House as a historic site, as a museum. And many first ladies have, have picked up that, that torch and, and run with it since. Um, most notably, or actually most unknown, but should be notably, Pat Nixon. Pat Nixon collected more historic artifacts and items for the White House than any other first lady in history. She just did it quietly and she didn't do it on TV, but, but Jacqueline Kennedy understood that that platform and understood that medium, even as new as it was, and saw it for what it was, and that's why she's the only First Lady to have an Emmy Award to her credit for that tour that she did at the White House in opening up to the people and making it a place of pride. All right, quiz question. Who, sure. Which First Lady was a direct descendant of the American Indian Princess Pocahontas? Oh, okay. That's a good, that's that yes, segues okay. nicely into into our next uh, woman of topic. It really does. That's a great question and, and one that not a lot of people ask for or know. But, yeah, Edith Wilson had a very, very interesting uh, uh, start to life in Whitsville, Virginia. Um, she is Wilson's um, uh, second wife, the better-known wife. And, you know, you really can't pick a, a, a first lady that was more involved in her husband's administration for the fact that he had a stroke, an incapacitating stroke. Uh, it was severe, so severe that he was going to, to resign from, from the presidency. And I've seen, I've held and read the letter. It's in Stanton, Virginia, at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Library Museum, where the doctor, Wood, Wilson's doctor, uh, personal and professional, in the White House and in his private life, had donated all of his papers. And there is a paper saying that... He, the, between the doctor and a, and a, and a, and a, and a uh, administration member, that you know, President Wilson's plan to retire does not please Mrs. Wilson. We're going to have to come up with another plan, <laughs> and and that's how involved she was. The, when he had his stroke, nothing, not a piece of paper, a note, a scrap, a piece of mail, letter, anything, made it to Wilson's eyes if it didn't go through Edith Wilson's checkpoint. And that that went on almost bef- before uh, uh, the stroke as well. There's there's a there's a, a beautiful uh, sort of like a, a metal tray drawer, a multi level tray drawer on Wilson's desk at his house in in uh, Georgetown in Washington D.C. And that would be carried up each night to the residence where Edith and Woodrow Wilson would go over the day's business, and she would sift through the inbox and say, "Okay, this is a priority. This can wait. This needs to come next." I mean, she was really hand in hand with that administration, and then she was, you know, she kind of downplays it and says nothing that she did didn't meet the president's approval or have. But I mean, you know, if you've got a stroke and half your body's paralyzed and you have to duck out of the public eye for six, eight months, and you're going to retire, how how much was he doing back there? Only only the people behind closed doors know. But she was she was running the country. She's our first unofficial female president. Wow. Yes, indeed. And she was um, a direct descendant of American Indian Princess Pocahontas. His first wife, Ellen Wilson, by the way, just as a little footnote there, was the only professional artist to become first lady. Um, We are going to take a quick break. Can you stay with us, Andy, through the break? I want to continue on talking about our our, uh, women in history, namely our first ladies. I'll throw out the quiz question for you. Uh, I know you won't Google the answer because I know you're going to know it off the top of your head. Uh, Who was the first first lady to wear wear pants in public? All right, folks, we'll be right back with the answer, and we'll be right back with our guest, Andrew Oak, first ladies man. Check him out at firstladiesman.com. We'll be right back after this short break. Now, back to your turn on 1330 WEBY, Northwest Florida's talk radio. The phone lines are open, so call in and join the conversation at 623-1330. We are back. If you're just tuning in, my name is Renee Giacchino. I'm Corporate Counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom, and we have been talking with Andy Oak. Andy Oak is the first ladies' man. He is also an award-winning television producer, and he is the author of two books titled Unusual for Their Time, on the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. You can order them on Amazon. You can order signed copies through his website, firstladiesman.com. I want to encourage you to buy Volume 1, buy Volume 2. They'll fit nicely in Easter baskets. Those That's coming up in just a couple of short days. Uh, uh, also, a great gift for any 
want any woman for Mother's Day or a father for Father's Day, but especially for Mother's Day. Mothers, buy it for yourself. Have your kids buy it for you because we're going to have Andy on again in May, right near Mother's Day, to talk to us about the First Lady's as mothers. A lot of them had a lot of heartbreak, folks, uh, but we'll save that conversation for May. And um, at that time, we'll even open up the phone line. So if you've read the books, we'll give you an opportunity to ask your questions to our guest, Andy Oak. For now, I'm going to hog him all to myself. Andy, before we went to break, (laughs) I I threw out our, our next quiz question. The first first lady to wear pants in public. Yes, I'm going to say Pat Nixon. You you are absolutely correct. And I should have said it was one we've already talked about. Um, also, interestingly enough, according to the data that I found, she was, and, and I know you talked about her and the important role that she played in amassing some treasures in the White House. Mm-hmm. She yeah. also created the White House tours for the blind and deaf, which uh, hopefully yeah. those are still going on. But that is that, you know, very, very memorable, no doubt. Um now, you mentioned um, you were talking about the importance of Edith Wilson, one of the most influential. Fast forward, um, wouldn't you put Hillary Clinton, Nancy Reagan, you know, at the top of that list? Do they surpass Edith Wilson, or or do you still keep her well, at the top of that list? Yeah, I keep her at the top of the list, and here's why. I, I think, I mean, you know, it is Hillary Clinton. I was just talking with a colleague earlier. You know, she broke every glass ceiling, but but the ultimate one that she wanted as president. But no first lady has been a U.S. senator and a secretary of state or a candidate for president. And when Clint, Bill Clinton won, he said you get two for one. And she went and testified in, in for health care and did things that other first ladies had not doing. So hugely, hugely, and, and, and like many of these first ladies, she was involved in resurrecting his political career. Uh, as as Ellen Wilson, Wilson's first wife was when he was president of of uh, Princeton, she helped craft his first political campaign. Ellen Wilson did, but here's where Edith Wilson stepped in, where no other first lady has had the opportunity. Her husband was all but incapacitated. She had to make decisions on a presidential level without the president, and then pass it off as his decisions. Hmm. So, you know, Nancy Reagan hugely. Hugely uh, important. I think Michelle Obama to to Obama. I mean, you, you can't have that level of intelligence. I mean, Hillary Clinton and, and and Michelle Obama are two of our most educated and, and intelligent first ladies. That's a huge resource. As all these women were, we you know all the way back to Martha Washington, as we mentioned. But that's where Edith gets gets set apart. Is that she was the president when he could not uh, uh, perform the duties himself for a brief period. All right, speaking of intelligent women, intelligent uh, presidential spouses, who was the first presidential spouse to work and earn a salary before marriage? I'll give you a hint. She was a school teacher. Well, I'm, I'm going to say Abigail Fillmore. You're going to be right. Yeah, and that's a remarkable story. And that's one of two first ladies that actually taught their future presidential husbands how to read and write and, and taught at some level, the, the first being um, Eliza Johnson. Eliza Johnson taught Andrew Johnson how to read and write in his tailor shop in Greenville, Tennessee. Hmm. And he was just a great orator and I think a, a real people person, and people would gather around in the evening at his, uh, at his tailor shop, and, and he would hold court, so to speak. And, and Eliza saw this talent in him, and she was... You know, I guess there are a lot of homeschooling and things involved at that point in time. And she got a couple books and taught him to read and write. And when Millard Fillmore was educating himself further in his in his twenties, I think it was as late as, as that, that he stumbled upon the library and the school where Abigail Fillmore worked and tutored, and he took classes and and learned things from his future wife. And she would go on to to tutor and and school children. In the uh, in the front room of the of the two room house that Millard Fillmore built for them uh, when they got married in uh, in East Aurora, New York. Speaking of books, who is the only first lady to work as a librarian and to substitute for a president in his weekly radio address? I, uh, in his weekly ra- okay, I didn't know the librarian part, but I think and oh I- wait a minute, wait a minute, oh this could be a couple as well. 
I know that Lou Hoover had regular radio addresses and was the first first lady to deliver a radio address, but I don't know if that was the first, if she stood in for the president or that was her own. I know Eleanor Roosevelt did a lot and wrote a lot of books. So I'm, I'm going to say nope, Eleanor I'm going to give Roosevelt. you one more hint. Also, <laughs> okay. the only first lady to give birth to twins. Oh, L- Laura Bush. There you go. <laughs> Wow! See, you're 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 schooling me. You're teaching the first lady. But see, you know what? That's the wonderful thing about these women and these projects, and and or this project. And I and I think it's why the C-SPAN series was so successful. Is that even for all the experts out there, and all the places, and all the things that the, the guests and the authors that we had on the show, and all the locations I went to, there's still more. And there, I, I've been to new places since the C-SPAN series concluded, and those are included places that relate to Volume 1 after I wrote Volume 1, so those had to go into Volume 2 introduction to sort of look back on it. I mean, there's still so much that we don't know about these important women, it's, it's, it's staggering. So that being said, what happens next? I mean, uh, you know, you can't stop at Volume 2, and I don't want to wait for another 10 or 15 more First Ladies or maybe the first First Man. I mean, what's next for you? Yeah, I do. I do get that question a lot. Well, the the the, the immediate plans are there's there's two. No, number one, I want to convert this into an online college class because the interest has been just oh, so endless. Such a and great idea. And I think idea. that'll be a fantastic way to to branch out, reach new audiences, and get this information into the people's hands that that want it and need it, and and teach the world essentially about how important women are as equal partners, and when we move ahead as human beings, not men or women, uh, that that's when, that's when, that's when we, we, we really start making great strides to the future. We have to accept women as the demographic and the contributors that they've been all along. So that being said, uh, as far as the books go, I am retracing my steps. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to places that I skipped because gotcha. of uh, time or, or, or financial uh, 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 constraints. And I'm going to put all of those into the chapters in which they apply and put Volume 1 and Volume 2 together and offer it as an extended uh, new edition. All right, Andy, we are out of time, but we're going to have you back in May to talk about America's First Ladies as mothers. As always, Andy Oak, First Lady.